All right. Hello, hello, hello. We are so excited, y'all. This is such an interesting and exciting topic. And I know we've heard from a lot of folks that are really, really excited that we're addressing this tonight. So we are so pumped that y'all are here and would encourage you to ask questions, to engage in the comments. And we're going to try to get through all the questions that you bring tonight, but also just have a great dialogue with this awesome panel. Um, as folks are coming in, um, I would encourage you just to, to take a minute, take a deep breath, sit down, and I'm going to ask um, just a fun question to get everybody settled. So anybody who's here with us in the chat, I would love to hear, is there anything special or fun that your family is doing for Halloween? Which seems kind of strange on a religious group panel, but I'm going to do it anyway because <laughs> um, I, I think I think it's just fun and I love Halloween. So um, as you come in, are you doing anything fun for Halloween coming up? Any fun family Halloween traditions? And I'll ask our panelists here too, anything fun that y'all like to do with your family for Halloween? Well, my five-month-old son has a glow-in-the-dark skeleton costume ready to go. <laughs> that makes me happy. Thank you, Caitlin. I don't. I don't think I can get away with taking him trick or treating, though. I, I would go for it. You can get all the candy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Carolyn. Um, so my family is my husband and my five-year-old and I, and we got. As some of you know, we got pet ducks this year. So we are going as a family of ducks, and yes. we are going to full blown like waddle to each house because I've told him this is how it happened. So I'm really excited about that. I would like proof of this, Carolyn. It needs okay. to be on video. I promise. I will. <laughs> and if anybody, if anybody needs more of a reason to sign up for the Faith and OCD special interest group, Carolyn brings her ducks. <laughs> so I, I yes. hurry, I'll do. Katie, get a duck for that. <laughs> Dr. Claggett Woods has her cat, so. <laughs> she's roaming around here. Actually, she's licking herself right now. I don't know if anyone wants to see that or. Ethan always has that going on in the back of community conversations. So <laughs> mm -hmm. Justin, anything fun with the family? Yeah. For oh, absolutely. So uh, I have a daughter who's five and a son who's 18 months old. So he, kind of clueless. But uh, ever since our little girl knew that there was free candy, it was positive reinforcement <laughs> burned deep in her brain. <laughs> she loves going out, getting candy, saying hi. She's super social, way more social than I am. Uh, makes friends, has made a best friend in the neighborhood. So we'll uh, probably just go out and get some candy and uh, maybe have a fire in our front yard and uh, say hi to, to folks that are the late stragglers. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that, that's awesome. Um... It, and it sounds like folks in the chat, Justine, trick-or-treating with your nephew, going as football players. I love that. Hi, Erica. Yes, Ethan, been there, done that. Ethan had the cat licking butt thing last time he was talking about self-compassion on a live stream and he didn't know it. So that was going on. Um, and, and Whitney, hello too. So we have some awesome stuff going on tonight. We're going to go ahead and, and jump in. I'm going to give us a little bit of an intro on what we're doing tonight. So y'all, this live stream is educational. It is not intended to replace therapy for treatment related questions. Please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org slash find help to locate a trained clinician near you. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in crisis or if you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room or call 911 or the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. You can also access online at www.988lifeline.org. And finally, we want to create a safe space. We want to be kind and respectful to everyone. At the end of the day, we're all here to support one another, um, but we do wanna note that this is being broadcast on several social media platforms and it's being recorded. So be mindful as you ask questions, but we do want you to ask questions. We want you to engage with one another. We just want you to do so respectfully as we support everyone who's here. Um, I love the idea that I think everybody who's here in the chat tonight is advocating as you share your experiences and as you ask questions. So we're just glad that you're here and want to create a safe space for everyone to do that. So we're going to go ahead and jump into some bios with our awesome panelists tonight. We are going to start with Carolyn, who is so grateful to be a part of this beautiful OCD community. 
She has suffered from OCD, particularly scrupulosity, as long as she can remember. She was diagnosed six years ago, and treatment has changed her life. She's now pursuing a master's degree in social work from the University of Central Florida, and she lives in the Orlando, Florida area with her husband and five-year-old daughter. In her spare time, she loves to paint and travel to new places. Um, and I'm a huge Carolyn fan and really excited for her to be like master social worker and help all the people. So it's, it's great to, to have her here. And we have Dr. Caitlin claggett Woods, who is a clinical psychologist who currently provides comprehensive assessment and individualized treatment for adults. Her practice primarily focuses on OCD and related disorders, panic disorder and agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and PTSD. Her primary approach to therapy is cognitive behavioral with experience and training in a multitude of evidence-based therapies. She's also a member of the faith-based task force with the International OCD Foundation and is actively involved in research with the current focus of exploring the identification of OCD amongst faith leaders. Dr. Claggett Woods is a director of Changing Minds, a nonprofit organization dedicated to addressing barriers to accessing evidence-based mental health care in the Ottawa area. So we're super excited to have Caitlin here. The cat, on the other hand, wants to leave, so I'm, I'm going to let her out. That's she, you know, that's okay. If she doesn't want to be a part of this great conversation, that is that is her her loss. And then we have Justin. Justin Hughes is the owner of Dallas Counseling, and he is a clinician and writer passionate about helping those impacted by OCD. His treatment approach utilizes CBT with ERP and techniques from other approaches like ACT and motivational interviewing. And he's a common contributor to the field of OCD treatment through writings, live streams, and conferences. He serves on the IOCDF OCD and Faith Task Force also, and is the Dallas ambassador for OCD Texas. Working with the diversity of clients, he also is a dual trained, he's dual trained in psychology and theology, regularly helping anyone to understand the interaction between faith and OCD, most commonly Christians. You can check out www.justinkhughes.com to stay in the loop and get free guides and handouts. And I would encourage y'all to do that because his content on Instagram and in all of the places is fantastic. So um, these are our awesome folks tonight. For anybody that I don't know, um, I am Katie O'Dunn. I always put the reverend on so that folks know I'm an ordained minister who also has OCD and that that is okay, that you can be clergy and have a mental health diagnosis, but Katie is just fine. Um, I'm super informal. I'm glad to be an IOCDF lead advocate, um, as well as the founder of Faith and Mental Health Integrative Services, navigating all things faith and OCD, especially here with the IOCD app, which is what we're doing tonight. So let's um, let's dive in. I would love to start just by by asking, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Caitlin, um, just kind of basic to jump in for folks who are on here. What is OCD? And specifically, when we're talking about religious scrupulosity, what's OCD and, and what's religious scrup? I mean, you're putting me on the spot here, man. I know. It's a tough one. Uh, okay, so OCD psychological disorder classified by the presence of obsessions, which are um, intrusive, unwanted, distressing thoughts and compulsions, which are either behavioral or mental acts, which aim to reduce or get rid of the distress and the thoughts themselves. When it comes to scrupulosity, it can kind of manifest in two ways, most traditionally in a faith-based way, right? So where those intrusive thoughts really latch on to your faith identity and attack you in certain ways, you know, it's like, does God hate me? Is God going to punish me? Am I faithful enough? All types of faith-related um, intrusive, unwanted thoughts that are very scary. But then it also can come in in a moral aspect, right? Kind of, am I a moral person? Am I doing well enough by the world? Am I perfect enough? Just all kinds of moral scrupulosity outside of a, a religion, religious perspective, I suppose. Uh, Justin, how'd I do? Fabulous. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and anything, anything to add, Justin, or maybe you can add on for us too, in light of OCD and religious group, what would the treatment for that look like? Well, um, I think I think recently I've been trying some experimental treatments uh, such as uh, chili, uh, cooking chili and, uh, you know, trick or treating a healthy. No. <laughs> so y'all. Celery juice. Choice, yeah, celery juice. The treatment of choice is cognitive be behavioral therapy 
and specifically involving exposure with response prevention. Um, scrupulosity, as we study it, uh, is a subset of OCD. And uh, the themes, sure, it helps to understand uh, how it shows up, um, a few details around it, but OCD is OCD is OCD. And uh, being able to see it, to catch it, to spot it, uh, that's the game changer. Uh, and not to be distracted by all of uh, the tricks uh, or treats, no, just the tricks uh, thrown. <laughs> We're going with the Halloween theme, uh, a person's way. Um, so uh, let me just give a brief sample that, that's really technical, that's really clinical. Um, so scrupulosity, uh, let's just, let's take an easy one that applies a lot of the time. Uh, did I say this prayer well enough? Did I say it right? Uh, well, first of all, that sort of thought may not seem like an issue whatsoever. And if that's actually brought up to faith leader or another person, they may say, okay, yeah, great. Or please keep, keep thinking on that because that's an important thought. But the thing about intrusions, they're always unwanted at their core and they're distressing, they're creating a problem. So it's not the everyday, oh, I just kind of wondered if I... Uh, was sincere with this prayer, for example, uh, but it's persistence, repetitive, uh, more intrusive, more distressing. And so the treatment of choice, a lot of people fear that word exposure. <laughs> They're thinking, oh my goodness, what? Like exposure sounds like giving up my faith or sinning or uh, changing my views entirely in a way that I wouldn't want to or doing things that uh, aren't in line with my values. And that's not what we're saying at all. Uh, exposure in other forms, uh, photography, for example, is actually letting more light into the lens of the camera. And that's what we're doing. We're letting light in. We're allowing a person to uh, see where uh, the process has gone wrong um, for them and gotten out of control, uh, how it functions as that wily thing known as OCD, uh, rather than as a specific uh, act of faith or belief. This is just one example, of course, among many. And so, uh, for example, getting the intrusive thought or feeling, what if I didn't say this prayer right? Treatments might involve, to start, finding a way at a level three, four distress out of a possible 10 to sit with that feeling. And to, if the person has the urge to keep praying until they feel right, maybe the person says a prayer for one minute and then they stop. And if that's what's distressing and they have the compulsive urge to pray longer or say it a different way or whatever else, uh, then the treatment is to be able to do that. Now it has to be informed, of course, with the person's specific beliefs as well. But that's just a brief example of what ERP might look like for something like scrupulosity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Justin. And I, I appreciate and y'all already having some great questions in the chat, which we're going to get, we're going to make sure to to get to all of those after we, we intro some of these topics. Um, but I, I love that you're highlighting treatment and the significance of the specificity around their particular tradition and the things that are meaningful to them, um, particularly because um, I always like to tell folks, you know, OCD is OCD is OCD. And uh, as you said, you know, all of these different themes are different, different gross flavors of the same ice cream that is OCD. Um, and we can address it with treatments like exposure and response prevention. But with things like faith, it can seem really, really tough because it's so significant um, to what a person loves and what a person values. Um, so Carolyn, and I know we're gonna get into more of your story in a little bit, um, but I, I just was wondering, as a whole, how has OCD for you really latched onto the things that were maybe significant or important to you? Because that's, I know what it really loves to do. Yeah, so um, for me, for sure, it, it has almost almost entirely been around my faith. Um, so I, I think, um, I mean, as a child, I just remember always, um, kind of dreading uh, church when the pastor would ask us to come up and, um, you know, if you're sure that you are a believer, you know, uh, then stay in your seats. But if you are not and you need to come up and be prayed over, be baptized, and as a child, it was just tormenting for me for that. And just, um, 
you know, just fear of uh, possibly missing the mark as far as making it to heaven um, as a child and even as now as an adult and uh, leaning into that uncertainty and those exposures have been have been difficult, but have given me actually a way to practice my faith now very in a healthy way and have put, I think ERP actually strengthened my faith because I really like, like I've seen in the chat, just understand more about what faith really is. It's just this this trust, um, not having certainty, but just having this trust in who we say we believe in. So, And Carolyn, that's such a beautiful thing. And I, I appreciate everyone who's talking about that in the chat too, that uncertainty and faith are not in opposition. <laughs> faith includes really this element of uncertainty and continuing to move forward and lean into the things that are meaningful to you, even in the midst of that uncertainty. But a lot of times in, in our faith communities, we feel like, oh, if I don't have certainty about this, this means that I don't have faith. Um, so I wonder, and I'll throw this out to the whole group, how do y'all kind of navigate this distinction between faith and certainty and what that looks like and how can we have faith without having certainty? Um, because to Carolyn's point, I think ERP actually can help us strengthen faith. But I, wonder well, I, don't, what... I don't know if this is exactly on target from what you're asking, but when you're just kind of talking about faith and the presence of doubt and just how, yes, faith is not the absence of doubt. And in fact, doubt is what actually will motivate us to in, in further explore and develop a relationship with God, right? Doubt is necessary to deepen our faith within, I don't know, I guess within our religion, within the God that we believe in, doubt propels us to explore. So yes, healthy doubt and unhealthy doubt, there's definitely differences between them, but doubt is absolutely a part of spiritual development. Thanks, Caitlin. I, I always talk about, you know, even in a personal way, when I first went to seminary, I had this big view when I was, I was going straight from um, undergrad um, to to seminary at, at Emory. And I thought there would be like this big flashing sign that answered all of my spiritual questions um, about faith. It's like, all right, I'm going into ministry. I'm going to know all the stuff. I'm going to check all the boxes. I'm going to have all this certainty. And um, quite the opposite happened. I came out with a lot more questions than when I went in. And for me, that was a part of my faith to Caitlin's point growing. It was like these new ways to ask questions. It was the, this new questioning, this new <laughs> way of, of thinking about faith and God and doubt and questioning, but also leaning into those things that were so significant. And it all fits together. The research tells us to nerd out a little bit that we're probably going to need a little bit more cognitive therapy um, in scrupulosity work. And what I mean by that is just a little bit more actually looking at and defining what do I really believe and what do I really think. We have to be very careful with that with OCD because it so quickly becomes obsessional. Um, one of my favorite experts says he spends about 10% of his time in the cognitive realm, 90% in the behavioral when he's doing OCD treatment. Um, and so uh, I, I like that reference point. I think it's just a bit higher, maybe 15, 20% in my practice with folks, not that much more, but just enough more to say, okay, what do we mean by uncertainty? Now, if you've asked this sort of question again and again and again, you're going to have to, at some point, uh, tolerate that uncertainty of not having a perfect definition. But generally speaking, we're talking about a feeling <laughs> and a felt uncertainty is uh, different than being stupid with a decision <laughs> and violating values, et cetera, uh, which is what it seems like uh, starting out. And so when we talk about tolerating uncertainty, uh, we're talking about actually being able to sit with that really uncomfortable feeling of, I don't feel 100% sure here. And teaching people how to do that, it has to be very individual, very personalized, um, but it also has to start really, really small because it seems overwhelming to jump to some category of the person's highest target in their life 
if I want to get over this, and then when they think of tolerating uncertainty and um, you know, let's let's say lack of faith or lack of belief, like am I really sure that I'm saved? Uh, as Carolyn was uh, referencing, or, or that type of question, um, it's going to seem massively big. <laughs> if that's a way to put it, to tolerate that uncertainty. Well, we have to we have to start much smaller than that and go at the level of well, what feeling can I not sit with? Faith and feelings and belief and feelings way different. We're in a whole different ball game, uh, and so definitely every uh, major tradition that I know of um, does not <laughs> does not say, "Oh man, you feel it; it must be true." <laughs> Quite the contrary. Uh, most of us have received points of feedback in any number of ways, be it from a, um, a scriptural or religious or spiritual or just a principled. Uh, point of feedback from a, a parent that, okay, reality is not the same as feelings. Um, so it's, it's a big thing that I have to do early on is I walk with folks to define what, what exactly do we mean in tolerating uncertainty? And then something that I just wanted to clarify for the folks watching as well is that cognitive work within OCD treatment does not mean looking at the evidence for something and against something. Cognitive work means so much, so much more. So for example, as Justin was saying, you know, kind of like, what does it mean to tolerate uncertainty? One of my clinician, favorite clinicians likes to ask, who is the God that you believe in? And who is the God that you're serving? And having those kinds of discussions is cognitive therapy, cognitive approach to treating OCD. So I just want to make sure that those that are at home are aware of that, right? Because you can often, get your back up, you hear it's like, oh, cognitive approaches to OCD, that doesn't work, that just becomes reassurance. And yes, it can, as can many things. However, it doesn't just mean looking at the evidence for and against something. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. That's that's such an important distinction, Caitlin. Thank you for, thanks for for making that. And I, I think this is a great great point to, to shift into a big component of our topic tonight, um, which is relationships and religious scrupulosity. And um, I'll give a little bit of, of background and we're gonna dive into a couple different ways that religious group can impact relationships. But um, I've heard from many individuals I know who are, are watching tonight that this has been a really, really difficult component where you might be navigating OCD, specifically navigating religious scrupulosity, in addition to your OCD kind of taking over your faith, it really might latch on to some other things that are important to you, like your relationships. And um, it's really, I've started to see common for a lot of folks that I've heard from for these the two things to combine in different ways where it feels like, oof, well, I have to make sure that God approves of this relationship that I'm in. Well, what if, what if God doesn't approve of this relationship? What if I can't be with my partner anymore? What if I'm not supposed to be in my, with my partner? How can I be sure that this is the person that I'm supposed to be with? How can I make sure that God wants me to be with this person so that we don't end up going to hell? I hear this very consistently and it can be really tough because sometimes someone's in a really value-driven relationship but just that fear, that uncertainty around well, what, what might God think about this from an OCD perspective can be really tough um, and can make relationships, even healthy relationships, really hard. Um, and we're going to talk about a flip side of this in a second. But, but Justin or Caitlin, I would love to hear um, your thoughts on that and how you might respond to clients as this comes up. I know that these are, are really difficult, difficult issues, but I know that there are definitely some folks watching tonight who might be navigating this in their own life. So I'm wondering, Katie, can you take one of those examples and say it again? Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I know I was listing out a bunch. So I, um, so I might come to you and say, I am worried that um, I'm having these consistent obsessions, these what if thoughts that God doesn't approve of my relationship. How can I make sure that God is happy with my relationship? I really want to stay in it, but I am really, really fearful because of all of these intrusive thoughts that I'm having that it might not be the right relationship and that God might be mad at me. How do I figure out what to do? 
I always find that kind of thing interesting, right? Because it's like, what if I am in the wrong relationship and God is mad at me for it? It's like, well, what if you re leave the relationship and God is mad at you for that? <laughs> we actually have no idea why God has placed these people in our lives. We have no idea what role he wants them to serve in our lives or what role that he wants us to serve in their lives. And so my mind kind of goes to, okay, but what about the opposite, right? If God is mad at you, or if maybe God is mad at you for being in this relationship, well, what if God's mad at you for leaving it? Like, how do you actually know what God's plan is? Because God has a plan for us. However, he has not given us insight to know what that plan is. Mm -hmm. So that's where my mind first goes when you're asking those questions. I love that. I know we had this conversation a little bit before and I love that flip side of, well, how do you know that <laughs> it, it's, it seems so presumptuous of us to, to make the assumption that, ah, oh, we must know what the divine plan is to move forward with our lives. Um, yeah, go ahead, Justin. I'm just going to say no. That's my response. No, I'm not <laughs> with you. Um, although we get the reputation for that as exposure therapists, and we sometimes do that. Um, <laughs> So when there, there could be a lot behind a question there, or it could be simple. Um, and starting out, if, if we look at the, the concern, uh, once we have a little bit more history, or for me as a clinician, a little bit more history of that, we're going to have an idea pretty quickly what is... Um, obsessional uh, some of the time, <laughs> but it's an endless pursuit to always try to be on top of, is this an obsession? Is it not, right? Because that's um, part of the uncertainty is that it might not even be. Um, and I think the greatest of all obsessions is, is this even an obsession? Is this really OCD? It's like the, the key, if there could be one obsession, I think it's that. Um, and so, First of all, at just a really high level, and from an educational standpoint, for a takeaway that anybody uh, can can make is that if you catch compulsion, if you don't compulse, you'll ultimately uh, arrest at least what you control about the disorder of OCD. So find the compulsions. Get rigorous about finding the compulsions. And it doesn't matter what the content is. And so, for example, uh, even if you find out that you're married to uh, or not married, you're dating somebody that you're like, man, this is a terrible relationship. I should get out of this and so forth. You can still be compulsing <laughs> and you can still address those compulsions, right, wrong, indifferent. Like the especially the treatment of OCD uh, involves uh, so much around doing that, uh, which actually helps to then uh, decrease feelings of being overwhelmed. Um, and even though we can't promise when, where, how much, it does ultimately uh, lead to less suffering. Uh, and so look for the compulsions. Are you doing a back and forth in your mind? Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? One of the first skills is actually going to be to target rumination and how the indecision uh, makes you feel crazy. Yes, I'll use that word uh, because it it's like uh, a gear shifter that's stuck. It's grinding gears for those that know a manual transmission for all of you Gen Zers on below listening to this, you won't know, but uh, learning to catch the compulsion uh, to offer a way forward is really, really key. And I can talk a lot about identifying values and how to do that as well. Um, but let me just start out and say, identify the compulsion. Uh, that's not a hard thing to do, at least at an entry level. I, I love that. And it, it is such an important component. And I mean, I would love to hear where the values piece might come into, because I think um, it, one of the biggest things that that I'm hearing from folks is, well, 
but how could I possibly continue to move forward with my partner if I don't know that God approves of this relationship? Um, and sometimes the compulsion, I wonder your thoughts on this. What if the compulsion becomes feeling like you actually have to leave a relationship that is meaningful to you? What if is that, can that be the ultimate compulsion? And uh, how do you respond to that? I would never call a feeling a compulsion. Okay. Sorry. Not a feeling. Sorry. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, the, um, what if the act of leaving the relationship becomes the compulsion in and of itself? Thank you for that catch. But that, to that question, what do you think? Well, one of the uh, biggest, I mean, kind of the ultimate initial compulsion is avoidance. Uh, so I oftentimes talk about uh, the the house of uh, treating OCD and the front door. Uh, if you never walk into the front door, you just avoid it entirely. It's the biggest of all compulsions uh, is just to avoid outright. Uh, and then walking in, there's more subtle uh, from there. And part of how OCD thrives and it's trickier to treat compared to like phobias, for example, is that there's way more than avoidance going on. But first and foremost, uh, tackling avoidance is, is really, really key. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk to clients with, with these doubts, like, should, should I be out of this really? I, I think that I need to leave. I don't feel this peace. Uh, and then we're talking scrupulosity. So maybe they pair something like a Bible verse with it uh, about uh, fruits of the spirit. Uh, for example, patience, kindness, fill in the blank. Like I, I should be manifesting these or uh, if um, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, da, 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 uh, a person can really uh, get overwhelmed with uh, any number of uh, obsessional themes playing off of actual beliefs and values. So I'm going to really slow it down with the person uh, and try to understand how they approached it, not just compulsively, but if they have been seeking feedback from others? Have you ever talked with that clergy member? Uh, because while, yes, uh, we, we work with and uh, talk about OCD, we might assume that, of course, that person's just been getting constant reassurance. Actually, quite the contrary. Sometimes that conversation with the clergy member is getting out of avoidance because they're staying in their head. And in fact, sometimes it's the scarier thing to reach out to another person and say, hey, what is a more official stance on this? or to talk to a person in a study or a community group or, or fill in the blank to say, y'all, what is what is y'all's take on this? Um, and so uh, this is, uh, yeah, on the clinical side, I'm gonna try to understand uh, what, what are a person's actual beliefs? Uh, is there something that's known to be an actual concern? And then what's, uh, what really comes down to choice and, and decision uh, with that? And it can be, it can seem very precarious, but if we're intentional uh, and sometimes slow, but doesn't always have to be super slow, just intentional with identifying, um, okay, well, what are actual factors that disqualify a relationship? What are factors that qualify a relationship? What actually would fit from a faith tradition standpoint and then anything that's outside of that list, which hopefully is not going to be too long, <laughs> truly, uh, when we're talking about like core values, um, you know, we can do it in 10 bullet points for each one. We're not talking about pages and pages and theses of, well, this is healthy relationship and not. Um, keeping it pretty simple. Uh, once we look at that, then we can start to identify, okay, well, if, if it's outside of uh, those things, and it's just the uncertainty and suffering with indecision. Uh, uh, it's it's about finding the entry point, uh, opening the door of that house of, of treatment and saying, okay, let's get out of the avoidance of this. Or if you've already gotten out of the avoidance, let's open that next door of facing whatever the thing is. Uh, it might be a core fear. I'm going to be stuck forever and ever and suffer. And because of my, uh, could be relational commitment, uh, I don't want to use somebody, take advantage of somebody on the scrupulous side. 
Um, it could be from a commitment a loyalty standpoint that I'm married for life. So, uh, and it can seem like a really big thing. Um, but we look at, okay, is this in the category of a known issue <laughs> that others of similar beliefs would agree with? Uh, or are we in the camp of, okay, this is something that uh, you'll have to learn some skills of uh, sitting with that discomfort and then choosing day to day what you're going to do in those moments. So that was a lot. <laughs> I hope that made some sense. No, that was so, that was exactly what I was hoping to, awesome. to hear from folks and, and that's so helpful. Go ahead, Caitlin, and then I'm going to kind of flip um, the other side of it and talk with Carol a little bit. Well, I was just, again, kind of thinking about the question, you know, should I stay with this person? What if God doesn't want me to be with this person? And what Justin was saying about slowing things down. And it's, again, where I think it is so important to slow things down at the beginning and not just jump into exposure straight away around, you know, maybe I should or shouldn't be with this person. Because my mind goes to the question, you know, if you knew that God approved of this relationship, would you want to be with this person? You know, not that, let's say he is a God who is like, you know what, whether you're with this person or whether you're with that person, I am happy. If that if you knew God that felt that way, would you want to be in this relationship? Right. And so if they were like, yes, I value this person. It's doubt that has me wanting to leave this relationship. Then it's like, okay, great. Again, who, what is the God that you believe in? Do you believe that the God, that God wants you to be happy? Is that the God that you believe in? Do you believe that God would want you to be with a person who makes you feel valued. Okay, great. Then we're looking at, again, the kind of conversation about like, what is getting in the way of that, right? What is getting in the way of living your life in accordance with the God that you believe in, right? Because again, as I believe it's John Grayson loves to say, it's like, you know what, if, because if you're not following what the God that you believe in wants you to do, then, you know, you're just pissing that guy off. Like you're pissing somebody off no matter what. <laughs> it's like the God that you don't believe in, but that you're serving, you're pissing off the God that you believe in. Like somebody's getting mad at you. So, <laughs> right. So that's, again, in the spirit of slowing things down and exploring like, hey, taking the obsessive doubt out of this for a moment if you knew that god approved any direction that you took would you want to be with this person then we have a bit of a stronger footing to determine where to go from there i also wanted to sorry I Katie. Laugh at all of these responses no i was actually just going to turn it over to you carolyn and you're welcome to add on to this but i also wanted to ask you if you would be willing to share about your story because there can be kind of the reverse component too of hey, I'm in this situation that isn't value driven for me or isn't healthy or doesn't make me happy, but I am feeling because of my obsession or I'm, uh, I'm using feeling words, but I, I, I'm fearful that I need to stay in this relationship. I'm fearful that the only um, faithful thing for me to do is to stay in this despite things that might be occurring. So I'll turn it over to you, Carolyn. I just wanted to add to based on the the example you gave, Katie, is just, I think, um, in many faith traditions, as well as just in our culture, I think that there is this, like, for example, in faith traditions, there's this emphasis on assurance a lot of times. And, and then when in relationships, there's this emphasis on the right person. And I think um, we get stuck, especially with sufferers being having OCD, we start obsessing over how do I know this is the right person or how do I know that this right person, right person for me or and God's happy with this relationship. Two completely things that we can never have certainty about. And yet we are obsessing over making sure it's the right relationship and that it's the right relationship that God is okay with. So both things we're never going to know. Okay. And so at that point, we have to live a to make a values driven decision. And I think this is where Justin was speaking to so well is just what is your value? And for you, maybe the value is that you are like Caitlin said, you're with somebody who treats you like you're a valuable human being and that brings you joy and that challenges you and makes you and brings out the best in you. And maybe that if those answers are yes, then you are taking the risk to be in that relationship, but you're taking a risk in any relationship, just so you know, <laughs> like you're never going to have certainty in life. 
And that's why we all live by faith. So, and that's why we're here. We're, we're here um, to live in faith. And, um, and I'm just going to speak a little bit to like my story about um, my history and being in a relationship that was very unhealthy. Um, when I was 21 years old and I was undiagnosed, um, I had OCD and didn't know it. I um, got married even before I finished college. I met a guy who was a pastor's son in a very um, legalistic uh, tradition in the Christian Protestant tra tradition. Um, I had saved myself for marriage. I, I grew up in this very um, purity culture and was very proud of that. And so just went into this relationship very naively thinking, okay, I'm, I'm marrying this pastor's son. But I started sort of getting a little bit, I would call like red flags. Now looking back on it while we were dating and engaged, a lot of control was a huge part of this relationship. I think he knew, I mean, I didn't know I had OCD, but he knew that I would always say I'm sorry and confess to him whatever I did that I felt like was wrong. And he started laying some ground rules of this is how you're going to dress. This is how I don't want you to smile at guys. I want you to wear, you know, skirts down to your knees. I don't want you to wear makeup in public. You know, I, I had no access to money. I had really, I didn't have an identity in a lot of senses because I didn't have any documentation, I didn't have credit cards, I didn't have bills in my name. So when I went to even like change my name, the DMV was like, how do I know other than your marriage license that you are a resident in this new state? And because he wouldn't allow me to put bills in my name. So there was just this really control aspect. And then with my scrupulosity, there became this confessional component of no matter what I did, I was confessing, you know, worried that he was going to get upset with me. And he did get upset with me, which kind of perpetuate this cycle. You know, for someone who has OCD, if they're already thinking their thoughts are dangerous and they're confessing that to somebody who might say, wow, that is a dangerous thought, you should really be worried about yourself. So I was confessing a lot of these thoughts, these scrupulous thoughts. What if I am not a Christian? What if I go to hell? I'm not sure I am a Christian. And if somebody who's already uh, more of a narcissistic, you know, never thinks he's wrong kind of person hears that, they kind of oh, wow, I, you really need to double down here on your Bible reading. You really need to double down here on, you know, we need to go to church, you know, three more times a week. And um, it just became to the point where I was um, highly dysfunctional. I lost probably like I was had 0% body fat. I was getting bed sores because I was so thin. I wasn't sleeping at night. I, he would not let me get on antidepressants or anything because he believed those were unbiblical. So it was a very terrible situation. Well, God really rescued me from that relationship. Actually, my mother-in-law at the time just told me, you know, you don't look well and we think you need to go see a doctor. Went to go see a doctor and I just started really talking to the doctor about, you know, he asked me about the relationship and he started saying, I think you're an abusive relationship. And you know what? Like, I just feel like God really showed me that like, maybe I just need some space. And during that space, you know, I started to get more clarity on my mental health and also on the health of the relationship. And I had several people sit down with me and say, listen, this is unbiblical. Like you are not allowed to leave this man, you know, and just so you know, if you get a divorce, it's unbiblical. And so for someone with OCD, it was traumatizing. Um, and, but you know what, out of faith, I looked at people and I said, I believe in a God who doesn't want to see his children suffer and I'm suffering right now. And I think this person is making me suffer more. I'm not sure all the details. I didn't even know I had a CD. I just knew this man was making me suffer. And through all of this, like we ended up in a separation. It was very clear, um, that he wasn't willing to, to reconcile and God had a redemption story for me. I will say like, I'm married to a wonderful man who loves me and treats me so wonderfully now. And, and that was the time where I had to risk and what Caitlin was talking about, that the God that I believed in did not want me to be treated as someone who was not valuable. And I think when we're, when any tradition believes that the creator, you know, values his creation. And if you are stuck in a relationship where you feel like you have to stay because your OCD is saying, hey, this is not okay with your faith, or you have to stay and you know that you're suffering and this person isn't treating you well. And yes, you will have doubts about that as well because we have OCD. But um, to risk to think that um, it's time for me to be treated according to my value. So back to that. So just a quick thought here, Carolyn. Over the course of that time, I guess, did you learn anything about yourself or about life or like, did you learn anything through the course of that period? 
Um, the course of the period I was married to him or like Just, during my... Like from leaving him to where you are today, have you learned anything? Oh, so much. So much about myself, so much about God, so much about relationships. And I would not be the person who I am today if that part of that story wasn't. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be giving this talk. I wouldn't be know that I had OCD. Um, and my child actually has OCD too. So like God has used all of this to mold me into the person I am. And I truly believe in a God who, like we said, he has a plan for our lives and he doesn't waste anything. So whatever you're in, you can't make a mis- you can't make a mistake. Like, and, and that's kind of how I view it, you know, like it all works out. So. But kind of that's what I'm saying, right? Like perhaps the plan that God had for you was to leave that relationship so that you could learn those things, right? Perhaps what God wanted for you was learning. And it was only through leaving this person that was abusive to you that you were able to learn those things. If you had stayed, wouldn't have learned those same things. So again, that's where we really have no idea what God's plan is for us. Mm -hmm. Um, It's again, it's moving forward through faith. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Caitlin. And, And Carolyn, thank you so much for honestly, your bravery and sharing that. And I'll just be authentic and say, Carolyn inspires me so much um, as somebody who is in ministry and who has been through a divorce and who had a lot of shame about that for a long time and felt like because of my own journey with OCD, um, I wasn't allowed to be happy again, or I wasn't allowed to find joy or continue to move forward with my life. Um, and it's stuff that's still really hard for me to to talk about. And, and Carolyn, you inspire me and I know inspire so many who are, are, are listening with your faith in the midst of that. Um, and, and I think we, even with, with your theology around all of that, this, this idea of, um, I always tell folks in the midst of grief or tragedy or trauma or loss or abuse or whatever that is, that I don't believe that um, the divine, how, wh- whatever that looks like for you, um, creates brokenness, but does give us space to create beauty out of brokenness, to continue to move forward in really, really powerful ways. And, and that's exactly what you've done, Carolyn, for, for your family and for your daughter and for so many people here. Um, and that's a, a beautiful thing. So I wonder, opening it up to our full panel, I have a lot more we could talk about with this, but I, I wonder... Along these lines, we've kind of talked about feeling like you need to leave a relationship or stay in a relationship and worrying, am I, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, but, but what about in situations where someone in a relationship is struggling to support you in the midst of your OCD or in the midst of your religious scrupulosity? Um, what if you have a partner who is doing this consistent checking to make sure that God approves of something that they're doing? What if they are constantly asking reassurance in the relationship as opposed to just from a faith leader? Um, It can be really, really hard, I know, for a partner to respond. We love the person that we're with, with OCD, right? And and it's so hard to not offer reassurance, um, to not say, no, it's totally fine. God loves you. And you are, I mean, you can say God loves you, but, but, you know, (laughs) to not say um, everything is totally fine. There's nothing to worry about. That can be really hard. So I wonder if you have any advice on how you might respond to that person and, not offer reassurance in the relationship, but also still offer empathy and compassion in light of religious obsessions. So to clarify, this would be the feedback uh, recommendations for the support, Mm -hmm. the support person. Yeah, absolutely. A big part of treatments. um, And also, I promise I don't dwell in darkness here. (laughs) I miscalculated the light here in a second. I'm going to grab my light box. But it kind of looks like you're at a really cool club. I want to come hang out. (laughs) Yeah, Ethan said I'm loving the vibe here. I decided, you know, since it's relationship, I do the kind of pink lighting back here and all that. So You've got the pink sweater. We've we've got some cool colors going on. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. The support side so big. Um, I'll tie this in. But first of all, Carolyn, thank you for just sharing so vulnerably, especially on you know. I mean, this is international uh, as well. It's just such a, a big thing to open up about her story and how difficult that is when when faced first of all with difficult situations and relationships. Period. But then to have something 
that isn't just a push, uh, but it's like a rocket ship into extra doubt <laughs> and uncertainty and fear and so forth. It just makes it really, really, really difficult. Um, and so sufferers of OCD really, really suffer um, first and foremost. And also loved ones really do uh, and can experience plenty of suffering themselves. And there's, gosh, there's a lot of different things uh, that I would love to say, but I think some of the high points too, getting that loved one support is really big. We know that uh, if a loved one accommodates, uh, and accommodation is basically compulsions by proxy, uh, that that leads to more negative outcomes. If they blow up towards the person or are critical or controlling, these also lead to more negative outcomes. And so uh, when I get the opportunity uh, the, the greatest opportunities in treatment are when I can sit down with, with everybody, but sometimes I don't always get that. Sometimes it's just a little encouragement at a distance or, well, here, if your spouse doesn't want to come in, uh, here's this resource or whatever. First, I'm just going to validate their own suffering, but also help to conceptualize uh, how uh, giving reassurance and compulsions really uh, makes the whole process uh, break down more and uh, helps the OCD sufferer to be sick and um, as opposed to helping them with recovery. Uh, but also a lot of times some of those pointers come up and some of the more uncomfortable conversations I have with support is when they need a little challenge uh, as well or a lot of challenge <laughs> in some cases. Uh, and in, in deeply entrenched situations, I'm going to say, hey, I highly recommend that you have a therapist for this. I highly recommend, uh, in some cases, a marriage therapist or couples, um, because it is just like with OCD, you can be so layered and so deep uh, that to break down those layers, a little extra help is needed. But in its more simple form, Validation goes a long way for the support. Um, being able to educate oftentimes goes a long way. And then to communicate that uh, in just terms real to them, here's what it looks like, here's what we're after, and here's how you can be a part of the problem. One last point that I'll make as well. Um, sometimes support is not very trustworthy. And uh, that's, that's tricky when it's a close loved one or a close family member. Um, but there can be wisdom that is applied in uh, the detail, sometimes that's shared or not shared. And uh, I help clients regularly to really identify helpful and healthy ways to open up and be vulnerable, but also uh, not, uh, not to do it in ways that uh, is just going to, uh, in, in Proverbs terminology, incur the wrath of a fool. Uh, so sometimes involving that support, uh, the ideal, yeah, absolutely, is pull them in and get them involved and to participate. But sometimes there are some really toxic people that are super duper unhealthy and uh, they're critical and making the process worse. Uh, and sometimes there's a, a limit as to uh, what's, what is to be shared with that person because they're going to misuse and abuse that information. Thanks. If I'm coming in from, you know, they've got the people in your life that care a lot about you and are aiming to support you, but are often you know, doing a lot of the things that actually serve to keep OCD going and getting stronger. I am a big advocate of having the people that you love coming to at least one session, right? For a couple reasons. One, there is a lot of learning. It's not just the person who's in treatment learning about OCD and how it works and the things to do to combat it. There's also things for the family members that are gonna have to learn the same thing, gonna have to learn about the accommodations and things like that. So even just from a learning perspective, how OCD works and what keeps it going, I'm a big advocate for having people come in. Also, again, the struggle that the family member experiences, their own personal struggle is important to address as well, right? So their distress at seeing someone that they love in distress, the distress that they might experience wondering, you know, does this person's intrusive thoughts, does that mean that they don't love me? 
Does this person's intrusive thoughts about maybe they should leave me, does that mean that they don't love me? And helping to educate that support person being like, no, it's because they love and value you so much that these thoughts are so sticky. And so again, like there is the learning about OCD aspect, but there's also getting out on the table that person's struggle and then what they need to help support themselves so that they can support the person that they love, which again, unfortunately comes with the conversation of giving in to the person's discomfort right now is hurting them, right? Giving in to this compulsion, helping with the avoidance is keeping the person that you love from recovery, Unfortunately, I know absolutely that what you want is to have them feel better. And it is so incredibly hard to see a person with distress in front of you. Unfortunately, doing something to alleviate their distress right now makes it worse for them and worse for you as well. So that is going to suck. And we've got to put voice to the fact that it is going to suck to have to essentially do the opposite of what you are feeling pulled to do. So again, major advocate for having the support people come to session so that we can have all of those things out in discussion. Yeah, and that takes a lot of good good points, uh, Caitlin. It takes some good buy-in as well. Um, I'm spending a lot more time. Uh, the more skilled that I've gotten, the more time I spend in assessments again and again and again with people. And then also the more time I spend now in readiness, um, because these things aren't just a hop, skip, and a leap. Uh, and also, the <laughs> we're never going to be perfectly ready, but a, a good balance of doing some stretching before a race <laughs> is really, really key. Stretching the whole day long and skipping the race is going to be problematic, but uh, we've got to do some stretching. We've got to do some preparation. And so inviting that uh, loved one, significant other into the room, uh, can be really, really useful in a couple of ways. I mean, one, let's say in the rare cases, this does happen, but rare cases where a loved one is really good at not doing any accommodation. Um, okay, well, that's that's great. But also they kind of, it's great to know that hey, this is going to be a stressful process. Um, if the spouse <laughs> went in for any other big treatments, uh, hopefully another person is going to uh, be notified enough to know, okay, am I going to have to drive this person around or push them in a wheelchair for a bit? Or will they uh, be using some crutches or whatever else? And uh, the biggest challenge, I think, with anything mental health wise is to see it because <laughs> it's just less noticeable. We don't have the crutches with this. It, you know, it's mostly up here um, and just as real <laughs> and, and actually more painful oftentimes than physical pain as most people tell us in the research, that emotional pain is more difficult than physical pain to most people. Uh, so we wanna get the spouse hopefully on board and uh, letting them know, even if they're at a great spot with not accommodating and so forth, um, that, hey, uh, this extra pain, uh, because this person is taking on, your, your loved one is taking on a big endeavor to, to get better. So let's prepare for all of this together. Ahead, yeah. I just wanted to, I, I've seen some questions come up around this topic really quick, and I just wanted to address this aspect. It's just, I think that there's a common thread of people with OCD that they um, they don't value themselves enough. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the questions was about avoiding relationships altogether because your mental illness might be too much. And what I want to say to that is just that I think having the doubting disease um, there is this sense of um, low self-concept or self-esteem, if you may, um, because there's this sense of I'm not worthy or I don't deserve or someone I'm a burden and no one wants to be with somebody who has this mental illness. And I think that there, you know, my therapist had me do so much value work on myself and to speak to myself like I would any other human being and and um, I think there is, they, they, I see these go hand in hand a lot. OCD suffering go with low self-esteem and it's, oh, I'm not good enough. I have this and it's doubting, doubting yourself, not being like we don't have a lot of confidence because we have doubts, you know, and I think it's going back to, this is a faith group. So there is this sense of 
you know, I, I, I've said this before, but like when you hold a baby, there is no doubt in your mind that this child is worthy and is valuable and you would never treat them terribly. And then somehow when they grow up, we think we can just, okay, now we can treat them badly. Like, no, the baby didn't do anything. The baby can't even do anything. The baby can't even offer anything but crying and spitting up and dirtying their diaper. And listen, they are valuable. They're inherently valuable. And if we believe that, you have to believe that about yourself. And then therefore you are valuable to this world and you're valuable to a relationship and you're valuable to a partner or whoever that is. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that before we end, we finish that that is very important, I think, for treatment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carolyn. That's, I was going to, we've seen this pop up a couple of times. So I was going to loop back to that. And I think Th this question is such a significant piece. And I'll, I'll say from my perspective too, we, we do tend to folks with OCD, we do tend to lack confidence. And it doesn't always look like that. If you watch Carolyn and I on here tonight or on different streams, it might look like, oh, like they're talking about their stories or they're on a live stream and they're all of the things. And, and that's not necessarily how it feels um, internally. So if folks are watching that and you're feeling alone in that, um, know that for me, regardless of how I present on these different streams or with the IOCDF as a part of OCD, as a part of scrupulosity, I worry a lot about what people think. And I've used all of my, I'm working on using all of my skills and tools to continue to move towards my values. But one of my my biggest stuck points with, with OCD really was, well, what if I don't deserve to be in a healthy relationship? What if I don't deserve to have a partner that values me? What if I don't deserve to experience joy? What if, what if I'm not good enough for any of those things because of my OCD or because of anything else? Um, and, and Brian and others kind of who asked this question, um, I, I want you to hear regardless of what your OCD is saying in this moment, that one, you're not your OCD, and two, you bring so much to the table for a partner. Um, I might be biased, but I generally think folks with OCD are the most creative, funny, compassionate, awesome human beings in existence. And I really think that your future partner or future family is missing out by you not engaging in that relationship because of that fear that it's too much of a burden. Um, so, so yeah, go ahead, Justin. Shame is such a big part of OCD. I was listening to Dr. Stephen Phillipson on the OCD Stories podcast. One of the recent ones is character indictment OCD, which is not some new subtype, but it's, it's rather the reality that um, one of the plays in the playbook of OCD is extra, more additional feelings of shame and worthlessness. And sometimes we can understand that through the specifics of what the obsession says. Sometimes it just really hangs around for reasons that aren't always clear. And we can even do exposures to those things as well, um, but also having um, some healthy processes, which can function as an exposure as well, where uh, on several of my current clients' hierarchies, saying positives about their treatments and about themselves are on the exposure hierarchy because the tendency uh, with that negativity bias and the, uh, the brain and overdrive trying to fix what feels like the problem is just always feeling like uh, a giant sack of crap. <laughs> and so... Uh, clients with OCD, everybody needs kindness and love, but clients with OCD probably need a little extra dose because the brain is just constantly throwing uh, all sorts of negative messages. And if I can also add in one last piece to, you know, the, I shouldn't pursue relationships because of my OCD, because I'm too much of a burden. Um, I have a question for you all. How does it make you feel when somebody comes to you for help? Any thoughts? When a friend comes to you for help, how does it make you feel? I feel valued that they are willing to come and seek advice and thankful for the connection and thankful to be able to be there for them. So why would you deny somebody else that same privilege when it comes to you? Mm. It's so good. So good. Yeah, I know. 
I love that, Caitlin. I love that. Well, this is, I feel like we need to have a part two of this because there's there's so much to talk about um, with this. Um, and I would just love to to go around and have everybody just do one final thought. I know we're a little bit over on time, but if you want to leave everybody with something tonight on religion, around scrupulosity, around OCD, around relationships, um, any of the things that you might want to leave folks here with tonight, um, not to put you on the spot, but Justin, you're on. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Always pick good lighting when doing a live stream. <laughs> what I'll leave you with. No, um, let me go with the light theme. Um, we're all imperfect and imperfectly walking through life is a necessity and Scrupulosity narrows in on what is not good enough, what more has to be done. But the reality is we can't even test something until we say, okay, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to follow it through and see. And borrowing from Joshua, um, the book of Joshua, uh, choose this day whom you will serve is interesting because there's actually a choice that's given in that instance and making the choice in and of itself is so important versus thinking that we're not making a choice by sitting on our butts <laughs> and just thinking about all the different choices it's a choice so let's to the best that we can make that choice with where we are today and see it through we find out we're wrong Okay, good. And I, had, thanks, Justin. I had two things, one of which exactly builds on that, which is I implore you to choose to serve the God that you believe in, mm -hmm. right? Really connect with who you believe in and I employ, implore you to serve that God. And then just also because at the end here, we were talking about confidence and I wish for all of you the confidence of a cat who gives no qualms to licking their butt wherever they happen to be. I implore, or I hope that you all care, build up the confidence that a cat has. Thank you, Caitlin. I, I'm glad to have that tangible image in my mind of my cat upstairs, like intensely <laughs> licking her butt right now. So thank you. <laughs> if the cats can do it, why can't we? Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that note, Carolyn. <laughs> I love that, Caitlin. Stop. I cannot follow that. <laughs> um, okay. This is in the same line, but the best thing my counselor ever told me was you don't get to know for sure, but you get to choose. So that's what I'm going to leave with. You don't get to know for sure regarding anything about your relationships, but you get to choose a values-driven relationship for you. So, and value yourself too. Y'all, I, I, my heart is so full with these amazing humans and with all of you in, in the chat. And um, so much of this hits on so many personal things for me too. And I think for me, you know, again, that biggest, the biggest exposure of them all for me was beginning to give myself permission to experience joy and to be happy at different points. That's why I have so much pink stuff behind me. It's where I wear, why I wear pink a lot. That started as an exposure as someone who felt like I was not allowed to wear things that made me feel happy because I didn't deserve it. And now I do that very consistently as an exposure. And for anyone who's feeling like they don't deserve joy or love or to be valued in any type of relationship or in their life, I hope you hear us today when we say you do. And regardless of how you're feeling in the midst of your OCD right now, you deserve a big, beautiful, awesome, full life with all of the spectrum of emotions. And, and that is the life that God has created you to live. And I hope you hear us say that. And I hope that this has been a meaningful evening for you. And just in terms of closing out, if you thought we were done, we are not because we always have IOCDF events going on. What? Wait, there's more. So tomorrow there is a research round table. Oh, actually, it has been postponed. But next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, um, National Advocate Ethan Smith will be back for a brand new community conversations. You can submit questions ahead of time at IOCDF.org slash peace of mind. 
Also, there are lots of walks happening this month for the 1 million steps for OCD walk. Visit iocdf.org slash walk to find a walk happening near, near, if I can speak at the end of this day, near you as we embrace uncertainty one step at a time. Um, if you are in Atlanta, please join me this weekend for the walk. I'm going to be speaking there in Atlanta and Carolyn is going to be at the Atlanta walk. So please come join us um, on Sunday and it will be lots of fun. And finally, registration for the online OCD conference on November 4th to 6th is now open. Visit onlineocdconference.org to learn more and register. This live stream is one of many. You can see the whole schedule of future streams at iocdf.org slash peace of mind. And you can also view recordings of past live streams on IOCDF's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash IOCDF. Um, if you didn't have your questions answered tonight, you can also check over there. We're doing um, monthly some OCD mailbags to make sure any of the questions that go into the chats get answered by, the, um, by really the next coming months. So you can check on that. And we also encourage you to remember to like and subscribe to get notified when live streams are scheduled. If you need resources, please visit iocdf.org. Um, you are always more than welcome to reach out to um, the IOCDF and um, feel free if you have questions from this stream to reach out to the IOCDF or to reach out to me personally. And I'm happy to connect with others on this awesome panel. You can contact the IOCDF at info at iocdf.org. Um, so, we are so, again, grateful to have y'all here tonight. I hope that you feel loved. I hope that you feel supported regardless of where you are on this journey. Um, and as I generally like to close these, I, I hope that as a part of this journey, you can have faith in your treatment. You can have faith in the divine or something meaningful that you believe in, but also faith in yourself. And all of those three things can go together and do not have to be mutually exclusive. We will see you next time and we hope you have a great evening.